G'day, I'm Ian Swain, the owner of Swain Destinations, a company that customises vacations to Australia, New Zealand, South Pacific Islands, Africa, India and Asia. And welcome to another episode of G'day with Ian Swain. Today we're heading to my homeland again and into South Australia and to start in a small town called Port Lincoln. From here, if you want to touch the very spirit of this ancient land, Gawler Rangers Wilderness Safaris will take you there. It is realized, it's a realized dream of Jeff Schultz, a naturalist whose passion for combining focused outback experience with luxury camping, he's defined a new Australian style. Kangaluna Safari Camp, a boutique tent camp that caters for up to 12 guests in a resonantly Australian setting. The riches on Kangaluna's doorstep are the spectacular Gawler Ranges formed 1,600 million years ago and carved through with fantastic rock formations, salt lakes and deep gorges and vast plains that team with flora and fauna. Let's welcome Jeff and he'll tell us his stories of his life in the area. So welcome Jeff. Yeah, hello Ian. It's nice to be here. It's great to have you here. And, you know, we've spoken many times about the experiences you create for our clients along the way. But I have to ask, what makes you so passionate to run these experiences for so long? Well, Ian, for a start, I grew up here. And I was a wheat farmer for a number of years. And this place has been developed quite cautiously, um, the farming land adjacent to this area with a lot of natural bushland left throughout all the farming area. And so even on a farm, I saw a lot of nature. I saw animals and their behaviour and learned a lot about them just through observation. And um, I just thought that the, the extension of that, this wonderful wilderness area that we're in here at Kangaluna, it would be fantastic to share this with, with other people. And initially Australians, but um eventually the rest of the world so um i just love to show people how australia functioned before it was developed and and where we are here it is just truly natural to, to what it was and here at kangaluna we're actually living with the animals they're not living with us and i think that's the big difference that we offer and that just motivates me Sounds fantastic, almost too good to be true. So tell us about the the day by day trips that you handle. I mean, I know everything can be customized to exactly what the clients are looking for, but you must have some set days that you do and explain what the clients will see and do when they're out of the ranges and, and what's unique about it. Yes, we we've got a we've got a um, a regular departure each Monday. Like Port Lincoln is actually two hundred kilometers from, from Kangaluna. So it's not like we can go and pick everyone up one day in, one day out. So Monday is our departure day each week. Um, and uh, we, we, we meet people after their flight from Adelaide, which is only 35 minutes in the hour, uh, sorry, in the air. And um, immediately we go to a colony of koalas outside Port Lincoln. Um, these koalas in South Australia were all introduced as a, as a buffer for disease that was occurring in the eastern states, like Kangaroo Island, for example, was one. And Mikara, Mikara Station, just outside Port Lincoln, was another. So we go there, um, 20 minutes from the airport, we're walking amongst these wild koalas, and it is very, very special. They are close, they are, they are low to the ground because of the habit of the trees there. So it's a wonderful place to, to meet and greet, and have a cup of coffee, walk around and observe these koalas. Um, amongst the other the birds and things that are there as well. So following on from that, we, we, um, we travel about three quarters of an hour and, and stop for lunch in a little Aussie wheat farming town at their bakery um, and continue on until we leave um, civilization behind our local town here called Woodna. Do you pick up a couple um, of Aussie meat pies? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And, and of course, they cater for everyone that doesn't eat meat pies as well. That's, and they really enjoy our international visitors because they're not really on an arterial road that, that carries a lot of tourism traffic. So we're treated like kings there. So um, from Woodna, 
we sort of make a few preparations with the vehicle and 30 minutes from there, we're in Kangaluna. So um, we rest up, everyone gets their tent, um, has, a, has a rest for a couple of hours. And in the evening, we take everyone out to see what they've come to see and that is the animals. So an hour and a half before sunset, we, we go off out to a gorge, have some, some canapes and some, some drinks. And just before sundown, we come back to the camp and we'll always see at least 200 kangaroos on that drive. And we're not, we're not just talking about one sort of kangaroo here, we're talking about three different species. The timing is important to see the three species and they are our iconic big red kangaroo, the Western grey kangaroo, and as well as the, the Euro, or some people may have heard it called the Wallaroo. So we'll always see those three species. And, and the numbers are, are just an average about 200. Different times of the year, um, coming into winter, you won't even count them, there's so many. And on an extremely hot day, it might drop off to 100. But it, it is an amazing opportunity for people. Uh, it's not a fast drive because we always have to stop for every animal. And I think they run out of capacity in their, in their camera cards, just taking photos of these animals. Uh, it is so good because it, um, it, it's got similarities to the African landscape here, the big wide uh, grassy plains between the hills. So it's not like you see them just rush across the road and disappear into trees. They're, they're bounding alongside of the vehicle. And we, we're almost floating with them. It's just a wonderful feeling to, to be out there and experience that. So of course we come back for dinner. Um, and we lay out lavish meals here, and they're, they're, they're quite innovative. Um, we will always ask for our recipes, uh, which we've never ever got around to, to doing, but many, many people ask us to email the recipes that we've got here. So a great place to invent them, because if you haven't got something, you make it up. Uh, there's not a story. You should make a cookbook. <laughs> really, yeah, that, that's one of those things that you think about, but. We were so busy here, so. And uh, the, the next day is to Lake Gairdner. It's one of the big three salt lakes in South Australia, but this one is stunning, absolutely stunning. A lot of people hear about Lake Eyre. It's a, it's, there's amazing events that happen there because the big rivers from Queensland run across the desert and flood this thing and it fills up with fish, which is, is quite an incredible thing. But Lake Gairdner has got the colour. It's got these beautiful red dunes and red hills right down to the salt around it. And, and when, if anyone's ever been to Uluru, the impact of Lake Gairdner is very similar when you first see it. You come over a rise and there's this white apron that just is spread over landscapes surrounded by these really rich red um, hills and beautiful vegetation. It is just stunning. It's a real wow. In fact, one of our explorers, when they when they first saw it, they said um, that this lake would have to be one of the most spectacular things to behold anyone on the continent of Australia. It was Stephen Hack. And and so there's, um, and there's talk of the um, the area the area out there hasn't been changed for since the one point six thousand million years ago when it was formed. That's correct. That's correct. It was a huge volcanic event, um, a rifted vol volcanic event. And, and it was 1,500 metres taller than what it is now. It's just weathered down. There's been no shift, no shift in plates or anything like that. So they're very gentle hills, but the exposing of the, the rhyolite columns is, is beautiful in the, in the gorges, the, the rock formations. So, yeah, it's got a long history, and it's part of our story as we go along explaining what has happened here, which I'll go into later. So we, we have lunch up at Lake Gairdner. Um, there is an old river bed that, that drained the lake that we visit. It's quite bizarre to go and see that because there has been no water running that river bed in the whole of uh, European history in Australia. But there are paintings of fish in the caves surrounding Lake Gairdner, but there's never been fish seen in Lake Gairdner by Europeans either. So there's been a, a big change in climate here. And so there's a whole lot of things that we can, we can show people as we go along. You can actually visually see the, 
the events that have happened because nothing's been buried or shifted. It's quite how, incredible. How old are the cave paintings? Do they know? Probably around about uh, 10 to, 10, 10 to 20,000 years old. Right. Uh, yeah. You actually have to crawl in on your back uh, because sand is blown into these caves. You have to actually s sort of slither in on your back and they're quite close to your face. So um, I haven't been in there since we've had all these, these wonderful gadgets that you can take photos a couple of inches away from things. So it will be great to get in there again one day and do that. So um, after lunch at Lake Gardner and a walk, um, we, we head back to the camp on a different, the different route. Um, we go down through the center of a, uh, a sheep station and then into a gorge on the, on the northeast side of the national park and then continue through to the camp. And of course, we're gonna see more animals on that drive again. Um, there's some walking opportunities. Um, for younger groups, we, we even offer more walking opportunities because you know, we, we have a great range of people, uh, ages of people. So we've got to make some calls sometimes whether we, we tell people about these little add-ons or not because some people just can't do it. We just make that judgment ourselves. So we're back to the camp for another dinner. We've got a lake near the camp here. Um, it's a part of this whole system. Just a little bit, just to, to go on a little bit more about that. Where we are here at Kangaluna, we're sitting in an old river valley called the Corovini Depression. And so from here on, there's thousands of small salt lakes, and some not so small. But there, um, the remnants of a river that ran from Lake Gardner through to the sea, about 200 kilometers to the west of us here. And, um, and during, the, during the period of the land bridges between New Guinea and Australia and, and the, the mainland in Tasmania and South Australia and Angle Island, the continental shelf to the west of us here was exposed for 250 kilometers out. It's a very wide shelf. And, the sand off of this shelf was blown inland by these tremendous winds created by the extra ice down on Antarctica. Shifted this sand 100 kilometres inland. And here at Kangaluna, you may be able to see in the background, um, the sand is white, but 15 kilometres north of us, it's red. So this is, we're on the extent of the sand that blew in off of the continental shelf. And in doing so, there were massive sand dunes that built up along the coast, which are now spectacular cliffs. And it blocked this river from getting to the sea. Uh, it was a lazy river because the elevation from Lake Gardner to the coast is only 200 metres. So it, it didn't carry much power or, or silt. It just, it just spread out and formed all these lakes. And it's a very spectacular thing to fly over the patterns created by these lakes. And lots of surprises in there too. A little geological things that, that have uh, formed over the years. So uh, we have a sunset drink on there with one of these lakes. Um, it's only three kilometres from the camp. We get spectacular sunsets here that linger um, because there's nothing between us and Africa. So you get, sometimes you get two or three events um, depending on where the cloud is. It's just quite amazing. Um, day three, we spend in the National Park. Um, we go particularly to find the yellowfoot rock wallaby. So that's our fourth kangaroo species that we have here. And, um, and do a lot more walking, get out in the bush and, and look at the flora. It's quite interesting here because we are really are the beginning of the Western Australian flora, even though we're just 250 kilometers west of Adelaide um, directly um, because of the old seabed. So, so the flora and fauna has evolved here over a much longer period. And um, there's, there's 50 odd plant species we have here that you find all the way up to um, the Pilbara, um, Exmouth on the West Australian coast and down to Perth, including bird species. So it's, it's quite, quite amazing that only 200 kilometers to the east of us, we have the Flinders Ranges. And, and we've got all this stuff, which is so different and it's so complimentary, you know, being in South Australia to be in one place and then come here and see this and to see how different it is. It's just incredible. So, yeah, we, that's a really, really interesting day. We have um, a Pildapa rock, which is a, a wave rock formation as well. So that's a real surprise because, again, that's a different geology. 
along that edge of the range, we have three different geological um, suites. So there's just so much to talk about in, in this place, you know, and I guess our guests must get sick of us talking all day, but there is so much to talk about. <clears throat> I'm sure they're hanging on to every word. They do, they do, absolutely. Our final day, oh, we, we have a couple of different options. We, we do, at the moment, we're doing pretty much four days here. Um, but with our international guests, um, we, we add on another very special experience down on the coast at Baird Bay, um, where we can swim with sea lions and a pot of dolphins in an estuary in a very, very safe way. Like the sea lions are in, in, a, in um, a contained area in a reef. It's, it's like being in a swimming pool. It's just amazing. Absolutely no danger at all. So um, from there, um, that, that, that takes the whole day. Driving down there, and then we do the, the experience and then transfer back to Port Lincoln to fly back to Adelaide or, or maybe do something else in this region. So that's pretty much our standard itinerary. We've looked at how we can change it over the years, but it just works so well, we can't. But it just sounds fascinating. And I'm sure children will enjoy this experience because you didn't mention them before, but are there any special Addy experiences when you have the young ones on board? Yes, um, I love taking them for a walk. Um, uh, uh, the, the, kids, the kids appreciate the little things more than the big things. Like you can go out and you look at um, maybe ant activity or um, um, a goanna's hole or something like that. And, and they'll sit there and poke around these things for ages. They just absorb everything that you say. Um, and so, yes, we'll, we'll take mum and dad off with the kids and, and do a walk around the camp or, or even, you know, out during the day. Um, and just, just feeding them new information. Um, we do have in, in Woodna, um, we have a water park in there. If the weather's a bit hot, we'll go off, do our activity during the day, but, but make to get back here earlier. And we'll whip the kids into town. It's only 30 minutes away and, and they, they just get in this water park and there's a half Olympic swimming pool in there as well. So, but generally they're so engrossed in what's going on here. We don't have to worry. And it's, yeah. Now I've read about um, something you have called a swagon. Maybe you can explain that to me. Yeah. Um, I walked past this old wagon one day on the front. It was just a, it was just an iron skeleton. Uh, there was nothing on it. There was there was no timber floor on it, no sideboards, and it had a whole lot of rusty wire on it. And I just I took a step back and looked at it. And I thought, you know, this just might work. So we rebuilt this thing. We've got some recycled Jarrah timber, put the sideboards on it, a floor, uh, made the chuck wagon top for it. Put a, a queen size double bed in there. That's a four, four and a half meter wag. Um, made it into a swag. We made the, the double bed into a swag. So we had a cover, a canvas cover that you can zip up just like you do the Aussie swag. Um, and uh, and it's, it's brilliant. And we offer it to single travelers with no single supplement, and it's been very popular. So it has its own bathroom. Um, it's the Outback Aussie bathroom. There's a look, it's not in the swagon, but you have a paved path. It's a lit up like a Christmas tree. So if you need to go out there in the evening, it's only five meters to go to the bathroom. Hot and cold running water, flushing toilet. Um, what else do you need? No, it's been brilliant. It's been absolutely brilliant. Similar, ex been... similar experiences to the tree houses that they have in the African game, oh, game yeah. safari lodges. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's just that's something right. different. Now, Jeff, this has been fascinating and listening to you talk about it and, and the day-by-day -day itinerary was just wonderful and, and the experience you're having with the families and just single people. Um, during the time you've been doing this, which is quite a while now, I'm sure you've had some pretty cool experiences and some of the one-off sort of ones. Perhaps you can share one notable one-off experience you had uh, with some groups of people when you're out there? Yeah, one that really, really stands out and is something that I never dreamed would happen. But um, I had a, a couple on a private tour from the Netherlands and uh, we were driving along and talking. And uh, the guy, he, 
he just said to me, he said, uh, Jeff, I think there's a kangaroo in trouble in that fence. So I, I pulled up and reversed and had a look and there was a, a female red kangaroo that had tried to jump over a fence and got, got its leg hooked up in the wire. Not always a good, a good story for a kangaroo when that happens. And I sort of expected the worst. But, so I walked up there, had a look and um, she hadn't broken anything. She was uh, just hanging up there and she couldn't reach the, the ground with her other legs so she hadn't damaged herself at all. So I thought, well, this could, this could work out. So I yelled out to him to grab a pair of pliers out of the, the vehicle so I could cut the wire. And he came up and I cut the wire and she dropped on the ground and she rolled a bit and she, she stood up and I thought, well, that's great. That's fantastic. And then she hopped off, you know, a little bit sore, but she hopped off. So I climbed over the fence and as I did, um, this little Joey was laying on the ground, no hair. And I thought, I, you know, I thought this is wonderful. I've saved this animal. Now I've got another problem. I, I'm, I mean, I can't just leave this little animal laying there. I looked, I picked it up. Some ants had already got on it. I blew them off and I'm holding this little thing. It's only, only sort of fitted into my hand. And um, I looked at her and she'd only gone about 30 metres and she, because the leg was a bit sore, she actually tripped over a, a a drainage bank because we were near a dam. I sprinted. I was flat out with this kangaroo just as she was getting up. I grabbed her around the neck um, from behind and and I sort of had this little Joey in my hand out in front. She saw it. She just stood up straight as you look like, and pushed against me. And I put this thing on her belly and it crawled into the pouch and off she went. It was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. I actually, they took a photo. It's not a very good one, but I've got a photo of the, me putting that thing back in the pouch. But that really stands. That's an amazing, amazing story. Lucky it wasn't those, one of those big boxing kangaroos, eh? Hey? No, I was pretty careful where I stood when I first got there anyway. You know, a kangaroo in a tra trap like that. Yeah, they can, they can kick, so... Yeah, but she was really placid. Yeah, no, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Actually, something else. We were only talking here last night, uh, looking at the birds and animals coming in. In fact, actually, can hear I've the had birds. Kangaroo. Yeah, um, there's a there's a pigeon here called a bronze wing pigeon. They're quite they're quite beautiful actually, but they have strange habits. Um, they never. We actually we've got water here. Uh, there's there's about 30 metres clear between the water and, and the rest of the bush out here behind me. They fly into the trees on the other side of the corner and they always walk across the 30 metres to drink and then they'll fly away. Uh, one night there's probably 20 or so of them halfway across, all scattered around out there, and a falcon flew over. And it was just the most amazing thing. They just all contorted and rolled and went upside down and they, they, they made themselves look like bits of wood laying out there. It, it honestly looked like bits of wood laying all over the ground. And they stayed like that for five minutes, not a movement, until one took off and flew just above the ground, about 50 metres over into a big bush, followed just very, very quickly afterwards by the rest of them. It was just the most bizarre thing. I, I wish we, had, we could have filmed that. So we see stuff like this go on all the time, right from this dining room. It's just, just incredible. And so animals, are, animals are great at adapting to the circumstances, and particularly when it means their lives. So certainly, that's for sure, yeah. Listen, Jeff, I really enjoy talking to you and sharing more experiences. Every time we get together, there's a new experience that I haven't heard from you, and it's really great to listen to, and, and I'm sure our uh, listeners are going to be enthralled by, the, by the, the topics we spoke about today. So I want to thank you and uh, I look forward to seeing you down there and having some more experiences with you um, myself. Um, and I'll, I'll hit that place in Woodner for the meat pie, that's for sure. Yeah, it's a good spot. Good spot, Ian. Okay, thanks, mate. See you later. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.